Testing. Testing. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox. Okay? Someone said to me the other day, they didn't realise how interesting the book of Deuteronomy was. Above everything that we've been looking at, all the twists and turns, the intricacies, the details. I hope above all things that we could all go away with from this school is that, is that sentiment that you didn't realise that the book of Deuteronomy could be that interesting. And I think if we could actually leave this school just with that one thought, a major milestone would have occurred in our relationship in our understanding of who God is. The fact that you can take a boring book and actually make it interesting. Testament to God, to the work of the Holy Spirit, to that it would serve to perhaps to be an inspiration to each and, each and every one of us as teachers that you can go to God's word and make it interesting for people that they would see not only new depth in the sense of like some intriguing information, but they would be inspired to see that actually meditating and contemplating God's word is not only necessary to receive eternal life, but is actually enjoyable. It's actually a pleasurable task. It's exciting. It's fulfilling. And too often the way we think about God's word, the way we teach it, is completely opposite. It's dry and it's boring and I think for many of us it doesn't actually have any value. So that was not my testimony, that was someone else's testimony. They didn't quite say everything that I've just said, but that's what I understood that person to be saying. That... They can now go to the book of Deuteronomy and not just know some information, you know, not just this timeline here, that um, the 50 days, uh, I think we've rubbed the 50 days off somewhere, but there's 50 days that they're at Mount Sinai doing their work. Um, the whole story isn't about men and women. It's about these brave fighting men who are over 20 years old and how that theme permeates not only through the book of Deuteronomy, but in other places too, as it impacts the book of Exodus. And we haven't even looked really carefully about how it would um, change our perspective of the book of Genesis. So I found that really encouraging, that if that's all we've been able to achieve, that people actually have found it interesting and they've been, been inspired to go away and continue to look at this subject, I think that's really um, a testimony to the work of God and the blessings that we've received being here at this school. Um, but obviously the study that we're looking at was Deuteronomy 22 verse 5. Now, I don't know if you have thought this, spoke to someone else, and they thought this thing that I'm about to say. And I can't say I was disappointed, that's probably too strong a word, but I thought, that's sad, that they didn't even pick up... Is the microphone working? It seems a bit funny to me. They didn't even pick up what... what I don't say the point of my studies, um, but what I was actually trying to bring forth. The people see it as two separate issues. So, what I want us to try and see is if we go back to the very beginning, when we first came to our school, what was the first things that I began to discuss? It's here on the board. I posed the question. What was the question that I proposed? My brother, what was my question? 
Why? Why are we not harvesting the Levite? That's correct. I framed it in a slightly different way. Or maybe that was the question. And then there was the answer to the question. Maybe that's more accurate. And what was the answer to the question? We find out that we're not ready, we're not in harmony. So that's where I first began to discuss the subject. And people have said, oh, you asked a question and we never even answered it. And perhaps we didn't answer it in a direct fashion, but it was a, it was a question to provoke an interest to think about, I think, a vital subject. Then what I said was, we moved on from that question and... Then we went on to this. What was this issue, this concept, Sister Snyder? How God was leading the church in the world? How God is dealing with the church in the world? God's dealing with uh, mankind is ever the same. So everyone receives the everlasting gospel. It's the repeating pattern. So to give you a clue, it was all here. I've just erased it now. There's many symbols to represent the nethonyms. And why did I want to highlight that issue? That's a fact, but that wasn't the point that I wanted to bring up. I had a, that was one of the points that came up in our discussion. But I had another thought, another idea. So hold on to that thought. Since then, we've been discussing all of this here. And what's all of this subject connected to? If I can say that simply. Sorry? Baptismal vows. It's about the vows. Not any old vows. Those four problematic vows. And we took that from the study of Deuteronomy. And what did we learn? What principle? What thought? At the back, my brother. Law and good advice. So law and good advice sounds like a new concept. Let's come back to here, Sister Snyder. We've got all these lists of nethonyms and the purpose of that was for whom? Whose benefit? The benefit of the priests. And I asked a question. What was the question I asked? I didn't ask the question, why do we go to all those lines? But it's connected to them. What was my question? Why do we have... Okay, so the answer to the question... This isn't a proper answer, but I want to frame it this way. So when we do all these lines, my brother... What's the purpose of all of those lines? You tell me the two options that we have. One option is? Okay, someone else. Why am I asking him this question? Tell him why I'm asking him the question. Brother Dennis, why am I asking him that question? But why am I asking him the question and not you? Someone else, why am I asking him the question? Because he already gave me 
Okay, so two answers. Why are they there? Answer one. Got two answers. You already gave me the answer. I just want you to repeat the answer that you gave me before. Answer one. No, that's not the answer you gave before. What answer did they give before? Sorry? Law or good advice? Law or good advice? That's what we wanted to see when we discussed this. Sister Snyder, law version. What, what, what does that mean? We've got 10 points. What would the law say? Don't understand my question. Brother William, do you understand my question? Yeah. Okay, what would the law, if the answer was a law, that's why we did it, what answer is that? What version? We must understand all the symbols that we listed. Or? All the symbols. Or, O-R, or what would happen? Or we die, we are lost. Or we die. Yeah. The law is, you understand everything or you die. That's law version. What's the other version, Sister Schneider? Good advice, so that's the other answer is good advice. And what's that, what response did we say for that one? We don't have to understand them. How many do you need to understand? Three? How much is enough? Two or three. You only need to know two or three. And we started off with, I think, 10. We went to about 14. And the problem is, we can't say it's law why can't we say it's law, my brother? That's that's past your credit. Why can't we say it's law? Because, not enforceable. because it's not enforceable. We can't enforce that. I can't force you to understand all of those. And? And it's not definable, it's not codified. Because how many symbols are nethonyms? 12, 15, 50, 100. How do we know? So it's not enforceable because it's not codifiable. Can we see that? So can we see right from the very beginning, our studies have been a uniform thought all the way through. It's not changed. We're looking at the same issue from different perspectives. Can we see that? Okay, so I wanted to point that out, that people say, well, you're just doing some random studies and they're not connected. Right from the very beginning, we can see how do we approach our work as priests, prophets, as the first fruit, as teachers. How does it work? And it, work, and it turns out that a lot of what we're doing is all good advice. And the problem is, at the same breath, we say it's a life and death message. So it becomes a complex issue how we deal with life and death, which is law, and good advice, which take it or leave it. So can we see that? Just at least I wanted us to see that from the very beginning to the very end, it's been a common theme all the way through. Can we see that? Then there's another theme that's been running all the way through. So we'll come back to here. So we did all of that, and there's another point that I wanted to, that I brought up in those studies. What was the other point with this picture work here? What else did we learn? Sister Dorcas. If I repeat the question, it won't help you. My question was, what else did we learn? If I give you more than that, I end up answering the question. I'm sorry. It's not so speak slower and
Okay, so we did another one. Priests, Levites, and Nethanim. So I'm going to do this. Why am I asking her this question now? Because she's already answered the question. Okay? She's already given the answer. Equals? No. So you gave the answer already, but you're coming up with a different answer. So you've got to remember what you answered. And when you give the right answer, you say, okay, now I understand what was being taught here. Don't tell me what you said before. Give me the answer. If you give me the answer, I know that you remember what you thought. Sorry? No, priest, there's not equal church. You didn't say that. Shall I help you? Okay. So this is not the answer. Do you agree with that? Okay. So now my question is, we can either do this as a maths lesson or we can do it the answer that you gave before. The priests are good people. The Levites are good people, so therefore the priests are Someone help her? Levites. Is that what you said at the beginning? Yes? Okay. Are we all okay with that? That was what we taught. Yes? So here we had all these signs of the Nethanims and we need to know all of them. Yep, that's the best advice which we thought was law. Some of us thought it was law. That's best advice. So do you want to give everybody the best advice or low quality advice? The best advice. So the best advice for a priest is to learn everything. Is that correct? Yes? yes? So. What's the job function of a Levite? Sister Jackie, what's the job function of a Levite? Before you answer that one, what's the job function of the priests? To teach. What's the job function of the Levites? To teach. So, we want best advice, and the best advice is to learn how much? What percentage? 5%, 10%, 100%? What's the best advice for a priest? To learn how much? It depends. What's the best advice? 100%. Can't depend. The best advice is to learn everything. Then someone says, um, I'm busy. I'll say, okay, learn half of it then. But that's not the best advice. The best advice is to learn everything. Is that correct? You agree with that? Okay, so if you're a teacher, what's the best advice? To learn everything that you need to know. So what advice are you going to give to the Levites? The same. Are we going to teach the Nethanims? We're going to teach the Nethanims, yes? That's what that was for. What's the job function of a Levite? To teach who? The Nethanim, the same job function. So if we need to learn everything, that's the best advice. What do they need to learn? Everything. So what does Sister Dorcas teach us? The priests and the Levites are the same. They're teachers who need to know how much. Everything. Is that a law? 
No. It's best advice. We okay with that? So once we do that, then we can say that they're all the same. I'm not, we, we, didn't extend, we didn't extend that study. But you can develop a logic to show that as well. If we're not sure about that, who do priests teach? How many groups did priests teach? How many groups? I heard two. How many groups? Three, three groups. Sister Brother Festus, the three groups are? The priest priests, yeah. Levites. Are we, are we okay with that? Yeah. Levites teach how many groups? Yeah. Two groups. Nethanim teach how many groups? Yeah. One group. Are we okay? They have to teach themselves so they're all the same. They're all teachers. Yes? So the Nethanims need to learn that as well as they teach other Nethanims. We, we're okay with that. So what's the difference between these three? None. They're all good. We're okay with that? So that theme, that idea, is what I've been trying to show in my studies, and for sure, Elder Tess has been trying to teach that theme. Why is that so important? Why have we taken virtually this whole school to deal with two issues. The difference between good advice and law and that the priest, Levites and Ethnims are all the same. Why have we, why have we laboured that point? The obvious answer is because we're not, we haven't learned it already in the movement. We're not repeating something that doesn't need to be repeated. There's an issue in the movement so we're addressing them. So, what's the problem in the movement with respect to this issue? The elder Tess is trying to be drawing out in her studies. What's the problem? Don't say the papacy. Because she's been talking about the papacy a lot, but I wanted just to see what the issue is that she's trying to identify as opposed to the subject matter. Brother Wilson. Because there is a, a thought that's running through our movement that the Nethanims only need to learn external events, you said? Did you say events? Is that the word you, is that the word you said? External events. Now, whose fault is that, that everybody thinks that? Who taught them that? Sorry? Okay, so it's our fault. We taught them that. So if they're going to blame and you said, well, you, you said that. You taught us that. And our response is what? <laughs> okay, we'll go three options. One of them is we're liars, which lots of people accuse us of. The second one, is just as bad. We only gave you half the information and we were keeping the rest for ourselves. Okay? So we either lied or we kept half the information. In many ways, they're the same things. Or, the last one is probably worse than all of that. Rule number five. What were we doing? We were guessing. We didn't even know. And now we've worked out some new thing. We say, oh look, we were guessing before, now we know a bit more. Okay? So, you have to figure out which one it is. There's a belief in the movement that all Nethanims need to do is just to learn external events. That's all they need to do. And the purpose of at least one of the major purposes of our time here at the school was to address that issue, that that is an incorrect understanding. Yep. And if we want to blame someone, if we want to, we could say, it's your fault because you don't, you're lazy, you don't pick up all the clues, 
or it's our fault because we didn't understand. So rather than blame one another of how we got here, let's acknowledge that we're here and then let's also acknowledge that we are fixing the misunderstanding, let's call it that, a misunderstanding between us, we say it that way. And it's taken us, from my observation, a number of weeks before we've got to the place where, I'm going to state it as a fact, but I'm hoping that it is a fact, that every single one of us here have now got to the place where we can recognise not how we got here, because I don't want to blame people, but that we did get to a place where we thought the nethonyms were different, that we believed this. So, maybe the accurate story is, we knew all the answers, but we only gave you half of the answer. We weren't lying, that that's everything, but we didn't tell you everything, and we're not guessing. You may, or no, you may or may not believe it, or you may or may not realise it, and then you may not believe it, now I'm telling you, that Elder Tess and I don't have secret meetings where, um, <laughs> where we have this deep strategy you teach this today and I'll teach this and I'll watch your back and you watch my back. It's not so, it's not so humanistic. If I could venture to say it's driven by the Holy Spirit, by providence, by direct intervention. What I, mean, what I mean by that is that when we, before we came here, I didn't send her a message because she was obviously in Kenya. I didn't say, you know what I'm going to do? The first presentation I have, I'm going to do this one here to set them up for you, to set the class up, to set the theme, and I'll set it up for you, and then you go and the coup d'etat and you get them. It wasn't done that way. She didn't ask me, what are you teaching? I'm going to say, oh, this is what I'm teaching. And I didn't say, oh, I'm teaching this, so I'm going to do, this will be the introduction to all your classes, so they'll get it. It wasn't that way. But what I want us to see is if you can see what we were discussing at the very beginning of our class with me and when you come to the conclusion of what Elder Tess has been teaching that it's the same thing so what people have struggled with throughout her class is amazing really if those people you whoever the you are if you had been attentive maybe you if you had fasted and prayed and you would have said that this movement is being led by two co-equal leaders. They say the same thing, look different, use different language, use different models, but they're saying the same thing. If you had the faith to believe that, then what you had all the ability to do is to say, whatever she's teaching, he must be teaching the same thing. But people didn't. People disconnected her and my presentations. And worse than that, they disconnected my own presentations from this question to good advice. They can't even see the connection between that. So again, we have different versions. Either, either I'm a bad teacher or you are not good students and you're not praying and meditating and asking the right questions. So again, the reason why I talk about these discussions in the accusative framework is because I think it's important for every single one of us to pass judgment. So we should pass judgment. I'm not saying you verbalise it. I'm not saying you be rude. But you need to be sure in your own minds. Who is at fault? Now the reason why this becomes an important subject is because this is not a new theme of mine. If you've been watching my presentations over the last two, three plus years, you'll know that that is a methodology and technique that I use frequently. What people might call, from where I come from, the blame game. Because I want to blame people. And people say the only reason he wants to blame people is so that he can look innocent. So all I do is keep blaming Elder Jeff for everything, and I'm saying I'm clean. 
It's not my fault. All the bad things are his fault. So you have to assess even why I'm doing that, which then means you have to go into my morality and try to understand what I'm talking about. So I addressed that issue back in Germany last year when I said, because people say this, I don't know if it's true or not, but they say it enough. In fact, my co-leader says, I'm the second angel. I said, if that's the case, because Elder Jeff even said the same, then the problem with the second angel, which is different to the first and the third, is what? Do you remember that statement that I made? He has a split personality. Yeah? It says two separate opposite things. You're good and you're bad. Remember that? I used the, if you watched the presentations, I used, the, I used it in the framework of schizophrenia. Dual personality, bipolar, however way you want to say it. And that would explain why one day I can be nice and one day I can be mean. One day I can encourage you, one day I can tell you off. And one day I can say, all the problem is your fault. You're not listening to my presentations. Or I can say, in the next sentence, the next day, you know what the problem is? It's not your fault. We just didn't give you all the information you needed. Are we okay with that? What I want us to become familiar with, with is that we view a problem or a situation from multiple perspectives. So I'll do presentations that make Elder Jeff look really evil. Lazy, I've used the word in the past. And yet, you do another presentation I wear, I have, I still do, to show you who he was and that all of us were required to obey him without question. So, there's a problem in our movement that we have come to a place that says what, Brother Wilson? This issue here. Repeat what your answer was. The Nethanims only have to learn external events. But we, we have to learn other things. And what, where will that theology take you if you believe that that's all they have to learn, external events? Where will that take you? So we teach by that concept that they're 100% right. And if they're 100% right, and we're 100% right, then at the end we're going to be best friends, because we're all right. And now we're seeing that is obviously not correct. And so now we're arguing that they're half right and half wrong. And what is it that they're wrong on? That was the question that Elder Tess asked, and she said, like a pregnant thought, it was down here, half right, half wrong, and she said, what are they wrong in? And no one ventured to have an answer, and I'm not trying to resurrect that question and say, give me the answer. I think we could tease out the answer if we wanted to, but I don't, it's not my purpose to do that. What I want us to see is where this doctrine takes you is, if they're 100% correct, and I just said, what did I say about us? We are, can that be correct? That statement can't be correct. Where must we be standing today? Half right, half wrong. So what we're doing is we're mixing our dispensations together and we're saying we're half right and half wrong. If we're half right and half wrong, who are we? Are we priests? Can't be priests, we must be some, as we're accused of, some kind of Jesuit demonic organisation. What are we half wrong on today? What are we half wrong on today, my brother? In the white shirt? Yeah. Remember, why am I asking him the question? Because he already gave the answer. What are we half wrong on? Not that. 
What are we wrong on? What are we not in harmony about? Everybody, what was his answer? What are we wrong about? Do you remember what his answer was? What are we wrong about? The four vows, the baptismal vows, remember? So we're wrong in the baptismal vows. That's one of the major things that we're not in harmony about. And you say, well, that's a minor issue. Doesn't matter what people do, to wear earrings or if they braid or whatever it is. What's the big issue? Especially seeing as it's what? What are those issues, Didi? What are those issues? Are they law? And what are they? See the good advice. Why is there so much disunity? Why can't we just leave it? Why the big issue? Because what's the ramifications or the conclusion of that? When you come to the Nethanims, where does that philosophy take you, my brother? Take you to the world. So we become like the world. Not the world in the prophetic sense in which we're understanding it. We become the classic definition of worldly. So they're teaching us. And if you believe that, the question that I want to ask is why are we here? Who's the leader? Us or them? Because everything, inspiration, frames it in what way? Who's the leaders? My brother? We are. We're the leaders. That's how the Bible frames it. God's people go out and give a message. This is turning things upside down. Who's giving the message to whom? The world are. The world is saying to us, Come out of, come out of, I don't know what, Adventism and join us. So we become Eden, Moab and Ammon. Can we see how we turn things upside down? It, it, it has huge ramifications. If you just see it at these simple fundamental levels. But it's not to see it, it's not enough just to see it that way. We need to understand the detail because the details will help us not to confirm. I'm not trying to de degenerate Elder Tessie's study, say that's just a confirmation of these principles. You need those details in order to develop the next set of principles and in order to walk faithfully through this dispensation and the coming ones. The details are essential. So it's not a minor issue when many of us, even when you're given the answer in the first two or three classes that says this, the people say, we don't believe that. The Nethanims are different. So we've picked up a number of themes. First of all, it's the relationship between good advice and law. And what I don't want to do when I make, when I want to, when I want us to see that, even though I brought it view, forth here, you know my position on this. So you tell me what your position is. All of those things, all of those symbols, that were on the board. How many of those things do you think you are required to learn? My sister? How many are you required to learn of, out of those 13 things? Give me the number or the percentage. There's 13 things, it was more, we'll do 13. How many of those things are you required to learn? You're not sure? None of them? Are you required to learn nothing? Okay, so you're sure it's nothing? So you think you're required to learn some of them? 
Not all of them. Let me ask a different question. Are you required to be the best possible teacher that you can? And what would the best possible teacher do? Learn some of them or all of them? All of them. So what are you required to learn? Some, none or all? Okay, so you're required to do all of them. That's what we should do. So, is it a law that you're required to learn all of them? Is it a law? No, it's good advice. But just because someone gives you good advice, doesn't mean you don't have to listen to the advice. There are consequences. So, the problem with us is we're so selfish, who do people keep on thinking about? Ourselves. Now, if I said to you, you need to learn 10 symbols of nethonyms, because how many nethonyms do you need to reach? How many nethonyms do you need to reach? My sister? You need to learn 10 symbols, because you need to reach how many nethonyms? You need to reach 10 nethonyms, isn't that right? One symbol for each one. You need to reach the heart of one of those nethonyms. And the only way you can do it is with symbol number 10. For nethonym number 10. And you say, I'm tired. I don't want to do this. I'm not clever enough. I can't handle the pressure. So I'm only going to learn 9. Leave the 1. Nine is good enough. Can you get to heaven? Can you get to heaven? Can you get to heaven? So the answer is yes. Now you tell me why. How can you get to heaven if you're only going to do nine? Because it's only... It's only... It's only good advice. It's only good advice to do 10. You don't have to do 10. You can do how many you want to. Because what you say is, I did my job. And I say, did you do it properly? You say, well, that's what I can manage. I've got responsibilities. I say, good answer. Can you get to heaven? Yes. What about Nethany number 10? Will they get to heaven? So there are consequences. Will you be happy in heaven? No. So my sister is agreeing, in heaven there is no happiness. No happiness for her. Why? Because of that tenth one. And whose fault is that? Her fault. When will she be happy? Ten years later in heaven? A hundred years? A thousand? A millennium? When will you ever be happy? You say, oh, I'll be happy in a million years. I'll say, in a million years, you know, I'm going to come up to you and I'm going to say, you know what, heaven is really fun. But what the problem is, is my child isn't here. And she knows that my child was whom? Nethanim number. And she'll say, that was my fault. So after a million years, she still won't be happy. So, it's not law, but there are consequences for what we do. So, when I talk about good advice and law, I'm not trying to degrade law. I'm trying to promote good advice. And personal salvation is not enough. It's not what we're just here for, to be saved. We're here to do the best possible job that we can. And the best possible job is to reach all 10 of those people, not only nine. So, this is obviously just a parable. Life is not that simple. And I'm not trying to condemn or judge anybody. But I just wanted to use the framework to understand what it means when we speak about good advice and law and how easy it is to make mistakes. So, the nethonyms, they cannot just 
have external events. They need to be competent teachers. They need to explain things to people. If that doesn't happen, we get to the place where we are like the world, and then the whole system breaks down. So, there are many misconceptions in each dispensation. But if I could take it to a unifying theme that connects all of these problems that we all have. I don't think I did this here. I think I did it recently in Germany. We've got four lines. Moses, the line of the disciples, which we call the line of Christ, the line of the Millerites and our line. And there are two recurring themes through all of those. One of them is the subject of time. And the other one is the subject of... You can either use my symbol or one that you have of your own devising. My brother? Okay, so I don't know if that was your own that you thought of independently, but that's the one that I've used. We know that that's a problem because with Adventists, what's the premier chapter for Adventists when it comes to prophecy? Anyone shout out? Daniel 2. Daniel 2. What's the problem that Adventists have? It's all about geography. They've put the two kingdoms separate to one another, earth and heaven. And why is that fundamentally wrong? Because they're too far apart. What does Jesus have to do? He has to link them together. Where does Ellen White describe the linking of Christ between the first and the second kingdoms? Christ Object Lessons, beginning page 17, it's chapter 1. If you read, no, it's not chapter 1, I think it's the introduction. Christ Object Lesson. It's chapter 1. Um, beginning page 17, she describes the work of Christ and shows how he fixes the problem. He gets heaven and drags it down to earth, or does he take he earth and drag it up towards heaven? Which one does he do? It depends, because you have two different versions. What is it supposed to be like when you live on earth? Sister... What's, what's Earth supposed to look like for you, Sister Fiona? Good. Let's not use the word good. Let's use the word Earth and... What's the opposite of Earth? So what is it supposed to look like here? Christ came down to Earth to get Earth and drag it up to Heaven. Agree with that? But it also did what? Drag heaven down to earth. And we only have these one-sided stories. So, earth is supposed to look like heaven, isn't it? Agree with that? I think maybe we could conceptualise that. Like, this school was supposed to be like heaven. Maybe you had some glimpses of it. Maybe you've had a miserable time here and it's looked nothing like heaven for you. Can't wait till you get somewhere else. And you say, if heaven is like this, I'd rather live in hell. Maybe you think that leaving. I hope not. Apologise even if you've felt like that for just a moment. Because this place should have been like heaven. And what we're required to do in a discussion like that, blame someone aren't we? We're supposed to go around and blaming someone. Whose fault it is that this school doesn't look like heaven? We've got multiple answers. And at the end of the day, whoever you want to target, put yourself into their place and see how you would have done it differently. And then put yourself into your own place and see what 
blame that you have for that. So it's all about self-analysis. So I mentioned this point here. It's a very simplified version of what the problem is about good advice. Someone gets harmed if you don't follow the advice. And Paul says, what? What's his famous verse that deals with law and good advice? What's his famous verse? Anybody? Hopefully I can find it. No one has any thoughts? Oh. Yeah. Anybody got an idea? First Corinthians, chapter. Oh, you're going to go somewhere else. Okay, so I was going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Where were you going to go, my brother? Philippians. So we'll, put, we'll write that down, Philippians. We'll go there as well. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Oh, chapter 4, who, right, someone said yes. 4? Because we'll go there, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, in a moment. I just want to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. So, it's in two chapters. Chapter 6 and chapter 10. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6 and chapter 10. Verses 12 and 23. So as you're turning there, I'm going to read Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, what things are, are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatever things are pure, lovely, etc. Is that the one you wanted me to go to? 4 8? And 9. And into 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So I like that verse. I took us to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And he brings this thought up in a number of different ways. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 is a very similar principle. So I want to give a story that is related to Paul. And the story is about meat eating. So, when it comes to eating meat, what's he going to say? Meat that's offered to idols. It's lawful to do that, but it's not helpful. Yes? It's lawful, but not helpful if you do so, those, those things. So... I don't, want to, I don't want to press the point any further because I don't want to keep on going down this route about the relationship between good advice and law. But the only point that I want to make is that I'm not trying to degrade one as opposed to the other and there are consequences if a person follows advice. Sorry, doesn't follow good advice. Someone will always get hurt. In the stories that I just gave from 1 Corinthians, the story about the meat, 
it's flipped the other way round. He says, my advice is don't eat meat, even though it's lawful for everybody to eat the meat. So the situation is reversed in that, but the principle is still the same. Now, I've run out of time, and I want to stop that because I want to, uh, in the few moments, remaining moments that we have, which is basically tomorrow, I just want to turn our, our attention back to Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Now, when we looked at Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, we approached this in the English. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a, put on a woman's garment. We looked at all of that and we saw the first thing we looked at was the man. And we said the most important uh, uh, words were where and pertaineth. But we looked at man instead and when we looked at man, it then becomes what subject? Did we say the most correct? Is that how we framed it? Yeah. We said this is talking about a brave fighting man who is 20 years old 20 years old, or he's 20 years or older. Are we okay with that? So this begins to give us the framework. We then went into Deuteronomy chapter 20, saw how the priest and it says the officer, who is a leader, not a military person, it's a civil person, is going to give advice and counsel about going to war. There's similarities and there's differences. So we saw church and state. We still need to complete that study. If we don't do it here at this school, watch online and no doubt I'll probably bring it up somewhere else to finish it off or you can finish it in your own studies. But it's to show that there's a difference between church and state. Their requirements are different, yet there is some overlap. Now, what I want us to look at is if we were to see this passage and looked at it in the Hebrew, you begin to get different answers. The word pertaineth in this passage means what? What does pertaineth mean? Someone shout. It means to belong. Let me see where I've got that so I can just confirm. Pertain. It means to belong, to be the property, the right or the duty. And I gave you two passages, 2 Corinthians 12, 4 and Acts chapter 1, verse 3. So you take the word in, in the English and it means to belong to someone or to own, to have ownership. We're okay with that. And so we went to the English and we said apostrophe S for the woman. Belongs to a man, belongs to a woman. Everybody okay with that? And then it said, in the English, what is the garment? The garment is the woman's, what is the man's? What's the word? That, isn't it? The that is the garment. And if you go back to the Hebrew, even if you don't know, I'm just going to tell you, that is not the man's garment. In the Hebrew, the word that is not the man's garment as it is in the English. So you have to approach it in a completely different way. And that is where our first clue is. What you find is that the word pertaineth is not possession, it's actually the thing possessed in the original. So we have run out of time but I don't want to leave it without giving our first introductory, introductory, introductory approach to looking at this passage in the Hebrew. Who has done that in their private studies? Anyone? Okay, by now you should have done that. You should have gone to the Hebrew and looked at that outside of class. Now, I didn't instruct you to do it. I didn't give you homework to do it. But if you had come here, so now I'm going to tell you off. 
with the right framework, with the right agenda, you should have, outside of class, looked at that. I've given you enough clues to do that. And if you had done that, you would have known a number of different things. So, in the English, it says, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Are we okay with that? In the Hebrew, there's a difference. It's a difference in how many words. You don't know because you haven't looked at it and you should have done. In one word, which word is that? You don't know because you haven't looked. It's the word woman. In the English, the word woman is at the beginning and in the Hebrew, it's at the end. Everything else is in order. So the place of the woman changes. You might say, well, that's not a big change. And I'm not arguing that it is a big or not a big change. But the way the sentence becomes framed when you see that begins to change the way you approach the whole passage. Now, what does where mean? 1961, remember we made this mistake because I was mixing the two up. 1397, I'd mixed them up in my class because when you focus so much upon something, it comes reflex action. And I was focusing so much upon something else, I put it on the board and I should have put something else on. H1961 means what in English? What's the word? Where? The word where is 1961. We're okay with that. We already laid that out. You should be in your notes. What does where mean? What does where mean? Someone said something? Who said? Who spoke? To put on. Is that correct? Yes? So we're going to take the concept of putting on. What is an actor? My sister, what is an actor? You've already answered the question, what is an actor? Someone who puts on, puts on a voice, puts on an act, and to make it really convincing, what do they put on? They put on garments. And if he's a good actor, if he's a good actor, what do you end up believing? What do you end up believing? He's the actual person. So the garment does what? Sister Emma, what does the garment do? It not only changes the perception, it changes it actually changes the reality. How did you say it? It transforms who he is. Because you know, if you watch a movie, it's not really that king. Intellectually, but in your heart, what do you think? You actually believe, when he said that thing, he actually said it. Now, when, you know, if it's a movie, it's not a problem. When it comes to a Bible story, it becomes a problem, doesn't it? Yeah? Because in the movie version, what's Moses' problem? One of his big problems. He's fallen in love with whom? Some Egyptian woman. It's not in the story, is it? So it becomes so convincing, their love affair, we just follow along with it. So... Wearing is garment. That's what it means. We've already argued, did I say Moses? I met Moses. If I said something else, I met Moses. Falls in love with an Egyptian woman. That's what the movies teach. There's no in the story. It may have happened, I don't know. But it helps to make what? It makes the person to become credible and believable, yes? To make it a normal person. So when he dresses up as an Egyptian or a Hebrew, you say, Charlton Hester was really the person. That's what Moses was. It becomes so convincing. If you go to all of our posters and you have a picture of Moses, nine times out of ten, what picture is that going to be? Picture of Charlton Heston. Isn't it? 
I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying it shows you the power of persuasion or the power of the garment. It really is real. It works. So this idea of wearing in the English becomes some benign, irrelevant thing. Is the woman a real woman? Is she a woman or not? Yes, all she did was what? Put on a man's clothes. Does that make her less of a woman? No, we don't believe that. She's not less of a woman because she put on a man's jacket. Our framework is too moralistic, too literal. Now, if a woman puts on a man's garment, does that make her different? Does that make her less of a woman? Yes, it does. If Charlton Heston puts on a rough garment or an Egyptian hat, what does it make him? Does it make him more Egyptian? Of course it does. If it didn't, the movie would have been a flop. You wouldn't... You would have said, oh, we'll give it a rating 2 out of 10 because he was a bad actor. He's not, convi he's not a convincing Egyptian. Yes or no? Yes. So when the woman puts on a man's garment, what is she becoming? Less of a woman, more of a man. And it's because we look at it that way we say it's forbidden. So I don't know why people say it doesn't make you more of a woman, because it does. Sorry, does, wait, we say it doesn't make you more of a man, because it does. Because Alan White's framework says there'll be confusion now, because people will think you're a man. You behave like a man, you look like a man. When, when, I, when I see you from the back, I don't know if you're a man or a woman. You say, oh, I fancy that person. You turn around and you say, Oh, that was terrible. I just fell in love with a man. Or vice versa. Yes? A woman sees this woman dressed up in man's clothes. She goes, oh, she, he looks really attractive. And then she looks at it. She says, oh, it's another woman. Oh, dear. It's crazy. Reject that. So it makes you into a man. If you go back to the Hebrew and you see what that word means, it's not as simplistic as putting on a jacket. It actually means what? So I'm not going to be using the Strong's definition now. We've run out of time. So I'm going to tell you what the intent of the word is. Not the dictionary definition of the word. It means to become. That's what the word means. It means to become. So if you say where, is that an accurate translation? Yes, it is. It's an accurate translation. I want to say it's accurate. When you wear something, it means that you become. The interchangeable thoughts. The problem is to become is a very strong phrase. Just to put on or look like or I put it on to keep warm is a very benign way of expressing the same thought. So one is a very powerful, strong statement, and one is a benign statement. And what we want to do is take the benign statement, and Alan White wants to do what? She wants to take the strong statement. She wants to say, we don't want women to dress like men, because what do the women want to do? They want to take the role of men. She knows what that, what that is serving, why the reason behind that is. And that's what the intent is as well. The in original intent understands that. The people who are, are not persuaded are people like us, you might call liberals. We say, no, no, just because you wear men's clothes doesn't make you less of a woman. I would venture to say the reason why women were changing their dress in Ellen White's day is because what did they recognise? If you wear a dress, it makes you more. And if you wear trousers, it makes you 
more like a man. Now this is not transgender, this is not foolishness, this is about power, about control, about not, con not only controlling other people, but controlling your own destiny. Because if you're a woman, what can you not control? You can't control your own destiny. You're at the behest of your husband because they work, they've got all the money, you stay at home, you've got no money. So you say, I've had enough of this relationship, and he'll say, go. And you say, where to? And he'll say, nowhere, you're stuck here because you're my slave. And so this issue is about power control, control of your own destiny and controlling other people's destiny. And it's a desperate attempt by women to change society. And they're going to do that through the symbol of dress. So this is not a study on the rights and wrongs of trousers or dispensationalism. I just wanted to see what's going on in the mind of the women. Because when we're approaching it, most of you said, it doesn't make you more of a man, uh, it doesn't make you less of a woman or more of a man. And I'm saying it does. That's why they did it. Because these women recognise the symbology of dress because it changes who you are. So, in the original, this is a very strong statement, and I'm saying Ellen White, whether she knows it or not, intellectually, she comes up with the right answer. She says, women shouldn't wear men's clothes because it will turn them into men. Let's reframe that. If you go in disguise and you dress up as a man and you're a woman, what will you be allowed to do when the elections are coming? You're allowed to? You're allowed to vote. So that's all you need to do. Go in disguise, paint a beard on, and go and vote. Yes? So it's a silly example of what the reality is. They want to show that they're equal to men to get rights. Rights to vote. Then rights to have equal power. Then rights to work. So it will take a, a generation and more to achieve their goal, but it gets to a place where a woman can now walk away from a bad relationship, if she chooses, and not be held hostage because she has control. Are we okay with that? So I want to say that in the original, this is becoming and what do you want to become? What do you want to become? You want to become a man. Now again, this word, 1397, is a brave fighting man who's over 20. So I just want to reframe that statement. The reframing of that statement, a simplified one word version that I want to give. This is not the Hebrew definition now. This is my word that I want to use for the definition. This is the definition. We've got the definition. Remember, let's do this, yeah? Everybody know what that means? This is the definition. This is what the translators say. So I'm the translator now. Okay, so I'm going to use the word master. So what this verse is talking about is the woman wants to become the one who's in who's the master or who's the one is who is in control of the situation and God is saying or the verse is saying we're not going to be doing that now if that's the case and it is I that's my understanding of what this verse is teaching when you put the woman at the end, it helps to clarify and see this is the point. So the verse is saying the woman should not become a man. And it's going to be done through the symbology of the garment or the dress. The woman is not going to have the same role as a man. And then it says, if we're going to just juxtapose that, 
the man isn't going to have the same, if we could say it, the same role as a woman. But the wording is different. So when you go to the second one, even though the conclusion becomes the same, the approach, the nuance or the essence becomes slightly different when we approach the issue between the man and the woman. We already know what the framework of this discussion is. It's in the clue given here. Brave fighting men. And over and over again we've seen that. All this story here is about who? The story of brave fighting men. Not just any kind of men. Brave, fright, brave fighting men. It's all about Deuteronomy chapter 20. This is the framework about, I think, how we should approach this verse. We should understand enough now about dispensationalism. How from chaos, God wants to bring order. Or from disorder, God wants to bring order. Now, Deuteronomy, this story, may sound like a very ordered society. Do we believe it's an ordered society? Let me ask a different question. Is it a very controlled society? Yes, it's a whole book of rules and regulations. It's very controlled. But is it ordered? So I want to suggest it's not ordered. It's a society that is disordered. It's not functioning properly. And so in a society that's not functioning properly, there's going to be rules and regulations. Now what I think our mistake is when we've approached these passages, generally, as, as Christians, conservative Christians particularly, or Christians, either we ignore the passage, we just ignore it, or we say that was a symbol or a story about an ordered society. And why do we think it's ordered? Who's in charge? God. We think everything that God's in charge of is order. And that can't be correct. Is God in charge of nature? Yes. Is nature ordered? It's totally, completely out of control. At every level it's out of control. And yet God is in charge of that. And it's not ordered. So I want to suggest, and there's other examples... that God can be in control of a situation that is out of order. So when we view this history, we should not assume that it's an ordered situation. It's a managed situation, it's in control, it's being controlled, but it doesn't mean it's ordered. So if that was the case, then we should know that God loves order. The first law of heaven is order. And we think that means, when you're parents, the first law of heaven is, is what? Control. And so when you don't get control, what do you do? You get a stick, and you create what appears to be order, but it's just control. That's not what heaven's like, is it? If heaven looked like that, would we be here today? No, because there would have been bloodshed in heaven and the controversy would have ended there. The law of heaven, which is the law of order, is not the law of control. And what we're being shown here, whether you call it good advice or law, is basically a society that's under control. And why do you need to control things? Because they're out of order. So a whole approach of the conceptual approach of how we look at that history, I'm saying is fundamentally wrong. We assume because God's in charge, it must be ordered. And I'm saying it's not ordered, it's controlled. It's a bad situation that's controlled. Is this earth ordered? No, it's not ordered. It's totally out of control. And God is managing it. He has certain 
controls. What does, what would Satan want to do to you? What would he want to do if you don't say you? What would he want to do to Elder Tess? Do you think? If you were Satan, what would you want to do? Kill her. Why doesn't he? What stops him? Control. There's control that have been put in place to stop him. Is this an ordered situation? Of course it's not ordered. If it was ordered, the way you'd, 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 you'd have order is first of all, get rid of Satan and get rid of all of his followers. We'd have the first steps in order, wouldn't we? And then we'd have to repair all the damaged people who are on God's side. Once all that's happened, then you begin to have order. Yes or no? Not understanding this issue brings us to another point where we have a wrong concept of heaven. When we get to heaven, will there be order when we get to heaven? Yes or no? Okay, so some people are already beginning to say no. When we get to heaven, will there be control? There will be. You won't be allowed to do what you want. There will be controls put in place. But that, that is not order. Because you're going to have people going into heaven who have got crazy ideas. Like you. You've got crazy ideas and you're still going to get to heaven. So it's going to be a place that don't, doesn't have order but it has control. Hopefully as time goes on, it becomes more orderly. If you go back to the original model, was there order in heaven? Yes, because there was no damaged or defective people in heaven. Yep. So, the reason why we're going to approach this passage differently today is what's the fundamental difference? It's the issue of what subjects? Control and order. What is God trying to do today? Establish, he's trying to establish order, not maintain control. So when people talk about those two, what was Eden like? Was it a controlled situation or was it an orderly situation? It was order. So I want us to think about not just Eden to Eden, I want us to think about order and control. So if we're supposed to be in a situation that has order, what we want to try to understand is how would we approach the verse. We wouldn't approach it in the wrong way. We'd approach it to see this command is given in the framework of an out of order situation that needs controlling. And therefore, if we come to our dispensation and we read the same passage, we need to understand what that means for us. And we can't apply the passage. It's not even that we can't even apply the passage in the same way. What do we do with that passage? How do we fix it for us? How does this passage apply to us? Let me ask it that way. How does this passage apply to us? Anyone? The way I apply that verse, God wants us to understand that verse so that we, uh, when we apply, we know that we are not going for a literal war. My, my question is, how do we apply the verse? Apply means put it into practice, isn't it? Yeah. Is that what apply means? How do we put the verse into practice? Brother Benjamin, what does the verse say? Women, women, women don't become men. Tell me, how do you apply that today? How do you put that into practice? Tell me, how do we apply the verse? 
How do we put it into practice? Anyone else? How do we put the verse into practice? Two answers, sorry, two, I only want two words for the answer. How do we put the verse into practice? My, that's not answering my question. The answer for me, we don't. We don't put the verse into practice. We say, let's throw away the verse. We do not put it into practice. The verse says, practice what? Inequality. So we say, we're not going to do that. So we don't put the verse into practice. There's no application. We can learn something from that, but we're not going to apply the verse. Either that, or you and I don't understand what apply means. Unless I'm wrong, I'm, tell me if I'm wrong. To me, apply means do it. Put it into practice. And I'm saying, I don't think we're supposed to put it into practice anymore. This verse is redundant. It has no relevancy to us. Why? Sister Emma, why does it have no relevancy to us? And I'm, gonna, I'm over time, we'll finish on that part. Why doesn't it? But we'll given the, I've given the answer, why? Because we're living when? In the time period of, of order, and that is only applicable to a situation that is out of order. You can't take verses that were created for out of order situations and make them apply to situations that are in order. Are we okay with that? So now I'm going to be reported by saying, we're going to cut out ver verses of the Bible. And so now I'm saying, not all of inspiration is profitable for doctrine, reproof and all the rest of that. I'm saying not all of it is, only some of it is. So take it as you want to, because I can't defend myself, because I've run out of time. Take it how you want to, but I'm saying we're not allowed to apply the verse. There is no application to the verse. You can learn a lesson from that, but you can't apply it. If application means put it into practice. Twelve disciples. Are we going to apply that? Yes or no? We're not? Twelve disciples means a church. Are we going to apply that? Do we have an application? That means we're going to put it into practice. That means God is going to get 12 people and make a church. It happened then, is it happening now? Yes. So do we apply that passage, that story, that concept? Yes. So we're so familiar with saying application, we come to the passage and we say, we do the same, default position, let's apply it. Can we see that? And now I'm saying, hold on. Who said we're supposed to apply this? We're not applying this. If we applied it, what would we be, what would we be saying? In some shape or form, whatever the spiritual application would be, what are women not allowed to do? Become men. That's what the verse says. You can't manipulate the passage. This is what a dust day of the Lord is about. People misunderstand it. You can't manipulate the data. That's what we keep on doing. And we manipulate the data because we're using wrong rules. We're taking one rule and using it like a paintbrush and everything looks the same colour. And we can't do that. You have to go to a story and say, that is not applicable today. That means scrap the verse. It has no relevancy to us. 
And then you have, then it begs the question, well, what is it there for? Because all these things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. Fair point. But that is not the same as application. I don't want to leave that thought half hanging. Does everybody understand what I'm saying, whether you agree or disagree? I want my point to be made clear. There's a verse, Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. And I'm saying, get the verse and scrap it. It has no relevancy to us. We don't have an application. We have no use for it. It does not apply. Application, apply. And the reason is, because we are in order. And that society is out of order. That is a verse for people who are out of order, not a verse for people who are in order. So it has no relevancy for us. What I haven't addressed is what lessons can we learn from that? How would that help us? Which is not application. So I'm assuming for many of us that will shake you, cause confusion, our enemies will love this. But for us who are thinking people, not for us who are thinking people, ask yourself, is this reasonable? Does it fit in with the model that you already have? Or is it totally contradictory? If we are talking about Eden to Eden, and Eden was order, I'm not trying to say equality and equality. It's not even that I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to take a fundamental principle because I want to make a fundamental point. You cannot take all the verses and just bring them to the end of the world. It does not work that way. And the reason it's looked so good so far is because we have cherry-picked our verses. We pick all the verses that do that and then we say, oh, the other ones, it must be the same because the testimony to a thing is established. So we'll take this one and try to spiritualize it somehow and it just becomes a mess. Or we come to crazy conclusions. To me, the simple one is, you just scrap the verse. It does not apply today. And if that's the case, I don't have to explain why it doesn't apply, because I've already proven that. I've already made the case for it. What I do then have to demonstrate is why all scripture is profitable. How this can be a profitable verse for us to have. Not to explain, like doing some gymnastics, oh, this verse applies to us, but we misread this thing, and it actually means this thing that we didn't mean. The words are there, they're plain, in the Hebrew, or the English, or the Greek, always means the same thing. Men and women cannot mix, cannot do the same thing, cannot be the same thing. It's easy to see. Let's not manipulate the truth. To me, the only logical conclusion, if I follow Miller's rules, I go for the most obvious answer. To me, the most obvious one is, it doesn't apply. Or, this movement isn't the one that's led by God. And that women should go back to wearing skirts and dresses. There are your two options. Either we've got it all wrong, and we're not in order, we're just in control. Or we are in order, and God is re-establishing the truth, and I know we're right. How do I know we're right? Because when you get your new bodies and you get your new clothes, what will be the difference? It'll be the same. We all know that. Everyone knows that. And then it comes back down to the study of the nature of man. It always comes back down to that subject. It explains. It's a unifying law that permeates through our message. If you get that, all of these things fit into that and they make sense. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your loving watch care over your people. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us and bless us. 
Help us to have clarity on the work that you have given us to do. Lord, help us to have clarity on methodology. Father, I pray that every single one of us learns to have confidence in rule number five, to allow the Bible to be its own expositor. And yet the rule is not so simple because it also says to trust in your ordained workers. People don't see that, help us to see that, that that's what that law is teaching. If we can have confidence in our leaders, we would know, Father, that when they speak, they speak on your behalf, and that all the instruction is profitable. Help us, Lord, to meditate upon the words of life that are being given to us at this moment, that we might not lose even a, a crumb or a scrap of food. Help us, Lord, to not be distracted by other things, by other issues. But help us to turn to you and to trust in you. Father, if we can do that, we can see that at this school, you have tried to show us over and over again through different models, this same theme. Lord, you've given us rules and applications and laws to abide by. Help us to follow these rules, whether they're the rules of prophetic interpretation, the rules that govern us. And if we can see that, it's my hope and my desire that every single one of us, Lord, would realise that this is a people who are coming into order, not a people that need to be managed, who are out of order and need controlling. If that be the case, help us to come to a unified position on what this verse means to us, how we should indeed apply it in our own dispensation. May this be our desire this day, Father, to grapple and come to a realisation of what this verse means for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.